Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Footnotes, helping you become a more informed neighbor, advocate, and believer. I'm your host, Dr. Jamar Tisby, and today we've got another interview with a book author. Before I get into that, I want to read you a quote from the beginning of the book that I think really captures the danger of Christian nationalism and this conflation of God and country. It's by someone you may have heard of. His name is Martin Luther King Jr., and it reads this way. Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman for the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with justice, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. If you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power and I will place it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. The book that we are discussing today is called Baptizing America, How Mainline Protestants Helped Build Christian Nationalism. The authors are Brian Kaler and Bo Underwood. The book is available right now for purchase, and I know when you hear our discussion, it's me and Brian Kaler, you are going to want to go out rapidly and get your own copy of the book. We talk about, what I talk about is white Christian nationalism all the time. It is probably a majority of what I'm writing about and researching in terms of my scholarly interests and my public scholarship. And oftentimes, we frame white Christian nationalism as primarily a problem of the right, of the far right, and particularly of fundamentalist evangelical Christians, some Pentecostals, and increasingly uh, some, some Catholics. What we talk much less about is mainline Protestants, the so-called progressive element of uh, white U.S. Christianity. And so Reverend Dr. Brian Kaler breaks it down and talks about it in terms of this book. And what we really get into is this idea of civil religion and God talk in the political sphere. How that happens, how that really started to happen a lot at the middle of the 20th century and with Dwight D. Eisenhower's presidency, and we get into some of the history behind that. But I think fundamentally what this book is about and what our conversation is about is not always pointing the finger at someone else as responsible or culpable for Christian nationalism, but turning the mirror on our own traditions, on our own faith communities, and asking how might the ways that we think about faith and politics and talk about it and try to inscribe it, inscribe it in, our, in our public discourse, how might that actually contribute to Christian nationalism. So we go into it. Uh, he's a, 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 got a really wonderful way with words and says in far fewer words than I do some of the profound truths about, uh, around democracy and Christian nationalism. So I am very eager for you to listen to this conversation with Brian Kaler about his book co-authored uh, with Bo Underwood called Baptizing America. I love it when we first hopped on, I said, Reverend Doctor, <laughs> you gave this face, uh, but I want to welcome you to the show, Reverend Dr. Brian Kaler. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, but Brian's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you got the credentials, so at least right. we can put this up front and sort of position <laughs> you as the expert that you are. I'm so excited to talk about your latest book, Baptizing America, How Mainline Protestants Helped Build Christian Nationalism. I always tell people the the, the topic of the book is not the title, it's the subtitle. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so How Mainline Protestants Helped Build Christian Nationalism. There is a large already um, body of literature about Christian nationalism, and it is growing rapidly. And your book comes into this, but it plays a particular role. So how would you describe uh, the gap in the current um, discussion of Christian nationalism or the problem that this book is trying to address? 
Yeah, and I appreciate that question because we do think that our book is offering something different. There are a lot of fantastic books that have come out about Christian nationalism, and we're in an election year. There's a lot more coming out right now as well. And if you took all of the other books and if you look at the subtitles, or sometimes it's in the title, you will often see the E word, evangelical. Mm. And even if it's not mentioned, pretty much all of the other books focused on Christian nationalism are looking at white evangelicals or white Pentecostals. And that's the focus. And, and white evangelicals and white Pentecostals deserve criticism on Christian nationalism yeah. for sure. But at the same time, there's another part of the Protestant world that's being left out of the conversation. I mean, if you look at the research by Pew and PRI, and you know, they typically divide the Protestant world into three categories. So you have your historically black Protestant, you have your white evangelical and Pentecostals, and then you have your white mainline Protestants. And white mainline Protestants and white evangelicals today are roughly the same size. So, I mean, we're talking about like half of the white Protestant world is being ignored in mm. conversation about Christian nationalism. But more significantly, until just a couple of decades ago, they were the dominant religious tradition in America from the colonial period. And so if we've been shaped in a certain way, this is a group that's had a hand there in guiding and turning our nation into the way we are. So that was why we wanted to write this book, because we started to realize that the, the white evangelicals of the world that are pushing Christian nationalism, you know, Mike, Mike Johnson and you know, Tony Perkins and David Barton and all those from figures that you're familiar with, when they point to, quote, evidence to say we were intended to be a Christian nation, we started noticing, Bo and I started noticing that as we traced where that evidence came from, it was things that white mainline Protestants helped put in there place. There it is. Yes. That's incredible. Um, yeah, the timing here. And so, of course, as a historian, some of my favorite chapters were the history chapters here. <laughs> but 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 that timing where we start as a nation culture saying more explicitly and vociferously that the United States was founded as a Christian. This is the, the, the era when white mainline Protestants are really kind of ascendant. Um, and so we'll get into some of that history. But let, let's talk about the terminology here what the heck is a mainline Protestant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because we are so much more, more familiar with evangelicals. In fact, evangelical often almost gets used in media as just synonymous with Protestant or even just synonymous yeah. with Christian. Uh, and so that is important to think about the difference here. And so, you know, there, there are a couple of ways of defining mainline Protestants. One is the, the seven sisters, if you will, kind of the historic elite dominant traditions, at least for most of American history. So that'd be, you know, your American Baptist Churches USA, the Episcopal Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, you know, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, the United Methodist Church. And I think I might have left one out. I wasn't actually counting. But they're, they're, those are your seven sisters there. And then, so that's one way. But now if you look at like Pew, when they categorize people, they actually do have a much larger list of groups that are also coded as a mainline Protestant. So if you're, for instance, in the denomination that I am, a cooperative Baptist fellowship, that is coded as a mainline Protestant. Uh, Mennonite Church USA, right? There's a lot of other denominations that are coded. And so there's this one way of defining mainline Protestants as belonging. What denomination are you part of? And these have tended to be a bit more you know, moderate and even progressive denominations compared to the evangelical denominations. And so part of that has also been a way of doing faith. Right? And so mainline Protestants are more ecumenical. This is some of the, a lot of the research in defining what a mainline Protestant is, more likely to work outside of denominational lines or even interfaith lines. One of the things that was a significant dividing point in the period that we write a lot about is that mainline Protestants were, at least at the leadership level, were more willing to engage and support the civil rights movement. And that is part of why they went from being the dominant religious tradition to seeing themselves eclipsed by white evangelicals, because some people in the pews didn't necessarily appreciate that civil rights support and found a church that that, that wasn't as supportive or even outright opposed to the civil rights movement. So yeah, there's a couple different ways of thinking about what is a mainline Protestant, but in general, they are that more ecumenically minded, uh, more moderate progressive. And so then when we start to think about something like Christian nationalism, right? We, we generally think about that as a, as a problem of the right, mm -hmm. um, but Christian nationalism goes across the continuum. And some of the individuals that we write about 
uh, the Presbyterian pastor who got under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, for instance, he, he, he marches with Martin Luther King Jr. He protests the Vietnam War. I mean, he is a progressive minister, but he wants us to be a progressive Christian nation. He wants us mm. to be a Christian nation. Now, and, and I, you do make a distinction that, uh, you know, mainline uh, Protestant is not necessarily synonymous with progressive, which is often, I think, the shorthand way that people have to think about it. So can you differentiate like how, how the two are not exactly the same? Yeah. So in some of the mainline traditions, you would find that they are pretty progressive denominations throughout like the Episcopal Church. You take someone like a, a group like uh, United Methodist, we've seen them splitting. So a, a couple of years ago, there was a much more diversity among United Methodists. They have lost a lot of their more conservative members, although they still have more political and religious diversity than most evangelical denominations. Mm -hmm. But like American Baptist Churches USA, and went on the on the research shows a very divided politically and ideologically uh, uh, congregations and and you know churches overall across the denomination. So there is some d diversity there, and that's why I do think that like ecumenical mindedness is yeah. a really important part. And there's also some ways of of how people talk about their faith, right? So an evangelical tradition puts a lot more emphasis on that moment where you walk the aisle and that mm. public profession and mm. the evangelizing of others. And with a mainline Protestant tradition, there's going to be more of a process. Faith is a journey. It's much more about your actions. You might be more quiet about your faith because you're doing your faith. And so, so there are some differences there in how that faith starts to look like both in the church and in the public square. I think that's a really helpful distinction that people can wrap their heads around where evangelical, and, and I come from that tradition, it is all about that moment of decision, that, that, that point of conversion, which is typically a point in time. It's a, it's a prayer, it's a baptism, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, my experience with mainline Protestants is it's much more of a, like you said, a belonging and in that belonging, a way of life uh, that is, it is a bit broader than that one decision that you made, right? So I, I think those distinctions are really helpful. And we're going to come back uh, a little bit to that mainline Protestant um, definition and explanation. But I also wanted to touch on another term, which is quite significant to the book, which is Christian nationalism. You look now, I just, I, I, I just taught a course on white Christian nationalism 101, it was called. And I gave five different definitions that <laughs> that I found uh, of white Christian and an, an additional explanation that wasn't quite a definition, but more of a narrative. And so among all those different ways of now defining Christian nationalism, what do you find most helpful? Or what's the shorthand you use to explain it to people? Yeah. And that is, again, this is another important definitional question because we're seeing some deliberate efforts to mislead people about what yeah. Christian nationalism is. Right, so we have people who are espousing Christian nationalism that know the term has some negative connotations. So they want to reframe it as a positive. And so, you know, we've got, you know, scholars. Marjorie Taylor Green, come on. <laughs> That's right, right? <laughs> uh, you know, put it on the T-shirt and wear it. Right. And uh, But we have, you know, scholars like, you know, Andrew Whitehead and Sam Perry and all of these guys have done the deep dive work that's really significant. And so I think there's two things that are important about Christian nationalism in defining. And, and first, I want to note that this, the work of the sociologists like Whitehead and Perry and Gorski always put it on a continuum. Mm. And so it's not that you're either a Christian nationalist or you're not a Christian nationalist. That they, they ask people a number of questions and then they score you based on how you respond. And so some people might you know, score 100%. They're, they're, they're for Christian nationalism on every single of the questions. But a lot of people are you know 80% of the way there or 60% or even 30% of the way there. right? And so it's this idea that it's a continuum. And I think that's really important because I think if you grew up in the particularly if you grew up in a white Christian church in the U.S., Christian nationalism was just in the air you breathe. Yes. It's just, it's been there in some more dramatic and more extreme in some cases, but it's there in all of them. Mm -hmm. And so then all of us that grew up in that kind of context, we have to find ways to detox from that, to move further down that continuum away from, you know, the ambassador, full-fledged Christian nationalism espousing individual. So that's one thing I think is really important in the definition is to recognize that it is a continuum and there's a little bit, I mean, honestly, it, it's like, it's like racism, right? All of us you know, that grew up white in the United States, we all have some racism in it and, yeah, and we have like, to work like, on finding ways to detox from that racism that was ingrained in our culture. Are you, are you uh, up on the, the whole recent conversation on microplastics 
and uh like that's everywhere because like you said <laughs> it's in the air and this is in in the water yeah. and so there's a little bit in all of us uh so as we apply, apply christian nationalism like you say I, I think that's one of the most pernicious aspects of it is it was so pervasive it is so pervasive that people don't understand this distinction of christian nationalism to them it's just christianity Yep, that's right. Because it was so common. And therefore, when you try to dismantle Christian nationalism, they think you're trying to dismantle their whole faith, their whole belief system, and not just differentiating between the two. But <laughs> that's yeah. just a, a, an addition and an amen. Yeah. And so that is exactly how I try to kind of a simple definition. We, we do some longer definitions, which are helpful. But the simplest way that I think in thinking about Christian nationalism is there's an ideology that that fuses, and I would say confuses, American and Christian identity. So just what you were talking about, right? They've, they've been seen as one, that to be a good American is to be a good Christian. And, and sometimes the rhetoric even goes out the opposite as well. To be a good Christian, one has to be a good American or at least pro-American. Oh, right? yeah. And so then when it is that whole idea of, of separating the wheat and the chaff, right? When you try to, what, what's Christian and what's gospel, it has seemed so natural that we have fused these two in our churches and our culture that people might think you're attacking Christianity when we're instead attacking mm. Christian nationalism. And that's one reason why we, we, we in the book, we, we write Christian nationalism different. We do this at Word and Way. We've done this for years. We capitalize the N in nationalism. Yeah. Because we're trying to identify it as a, a different religious tradition, if you will, that it is something different wow. than Christianity. So we capitalize religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. So Christian nationalism as significantly enough different because it completely reframes and flips on its head the clear red letters of Jesus. Wow. That's really significant because you're essentially treating it as another religion, therefore making it easier to distinguish or, or, or bolstering your case to distinguish between Christianity of Christ and Christian nationalism. That's really significant. So capital C, capital N. That's right. On That's right. I mean, those. it's a heresy. It's a heresy done in our name. So mm. as Christians, we have a responsibility to speak out against it. Yeah, uh, But yeah, we yeah, want to yeah. be very clear that Christian nationalism is it's a threat to democracy, but it's also a threat to our faith because it is not Christianity. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, going back to the mainline Protestant uh, definitions and explanations, I found it really significant that you had Reverend Adrian Thorne, who's the senior minister of Riverside Church in New York City, write the foreword. Um, now, there's a lot of thought that goes into who writes the foreword because they sort of represent in a way or symbolize in a way what the book is about or the argument the book's trying to make. So why Reverend Adrian Thorne? Yeah, and I will know. I mean, she was our first choice and our only person that we asked <laughs> to write the foreword. So, I mean, you know that sometimes that doesn't always work out. Exactly. And, uh, and, and, and you don't know what someone's going to say either. And I mean, it popped in and it's just, it's beautiful. It, it, mm. We were just beyond thrilled with it. And so there was a number of reasons. I mean, you know, Riverside, the Riverside Church in New York City, if you're talking about the mainline Protestant world, <laughs> is, you know, if there's a, you know, kind of capital representative yeah. congregation, this one would be at the top of the list. And I mean, it's 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 already uh, it's got a prominent ministers that have been there in, in that pulpit throughout its history. It, it's actually duly aligned with two of the seven sisters. And so yeah. that was obviously a big attraction. And then Reverend Thorne as well. I mean, she actually comes from a couple other mainline Protestant traditions that she brings uh, before coming into this pulpit. I got to know her. I interviewed her right after she started at Riverside Church. We had just a fantastic conversation. Mm -hmm. She wrote a devotional for us for our, our Advent series that we do. And so we had, we had a relationship building. And, and then honestly, as two white guys, Bo and I, as we had put together this book, we also thought it was really important that we didn't just ask another white guy to write the foreword. <laughs> Uh, as much of a check on our work as anything else, right? Mm. You know, if we sent this off and she had said, this is horrible, <laughs> I don't, you know, buy this. You know, it's not just that we would have shopped around and tried to find another forward writer. We would have been like, okay, what's wrong with our yeah. book, right? And so to, to get that kind of affirmation was, was, was so meaningful. And we're really excited that when people open up the book, her words are the first things that you're going to read. And she does a great forward. A lot of forwards are skippable <laughs> people are just kind of doing them or they may even have someone else on their team right. write it um but this one was really emotional and heartfelt and i think in her role as the senior minister of such a historic and representative mainline church 
she felt it deeply, um, personally and uh, ministerially. And that comes through in the foreword. So I just thought that was a great choice and a wonderful sort of lead in to the book. Um, now, and, and she's black. It, it, well, well, first of all, historic Riverside Church, that's one of the um, many historic things that went down there. Martin Luther King Jr. gives his uh, three evils speech, racism, militarism, and, and poverty, right? So, so that's a significant place where they did that. I think also, is that where James Foreman yes. read the Black Manifesto? It is. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's so like, much like, has happened there. Yeah. <laughs> you want to make a statement? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, he chose that pulpit church. for a reason. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so you know, uh, Reverend uh, Adrian herself plus you know, all the momentous events that took place at Riverside Church. It's just a perfect articulation, I think, uh, uh, to lead into the book. And then along with that, she is she the first black minister at Riverside? She's the first black female minister. Black female. Okay. Yes. So, you know, that, that let's talk about race then in, yeah. in the context of this whole discussion. Now, I typically call it white Christian nationalism because I'm trying to make a point about how integral racial constructions and racial identity is to Christian nationalism writ large. How do you talk about or think about race in relation to Christian nationalism? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because So whenever I'm giving a presentation at a church on Christian nationalism, I, I, I do try to make a point early on in the presentation that I use the shorter term Christian nationalism, but we are talking about white Christian nationalism, that racism is embedded in the ideology. The sociology mm -hmm. research shows us this, that, I mean, it's a powerful ideology. We, we've, you know, it, 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 it and people who are, are higher on the continuum of Christian nationalism are more likely to espouse racist opinions and support racist policies and so forth. And so you know, that's really important to in part of it. And also, it just gets to the basic idea of Christian nationalism. So right, if we were founded as a Christian nation, which is a key argument to Christian nationalism, right? They're not just arguing that we should be a Christian nation. They're arguing that we have been, that we were intended from the beginning to be a Christian nation. That can only be true for white people. I mean, a, a nation that was founded on the genocide of Native Americans and the enslavement of black Africans was never intended to be a nation for them, whether they were Christian or not. And so, you know, Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism, I, I see those terms as synonymous. Pick up your mic and drop it. Because there's a <laughs> mic drop moment. There's a wonderful, this is such a great summation of what takes me many hundreds more words <laughs> to, to try to describe. Um, but you're right. Like, like this is what I try to set. This is the example that I use that never quite hits the way I want it to. But in, during World War II, in pop culture, when they wanted to to embody the the American spirit. Marvel Comics came up with a character, Captain America. <laughs> it's all in the name, Captain America, right? And it's all in the figure of a white, able-bodied male, blonde hair, blue-eyed, I guess, maybe brown hair, I don't know. But and 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 then I think on the first comic, first Captain America comic, it shows him punching Hitler, right? And it's just, first of all, it gives it, it's gonna get us into um, really the thick of some of the historical analysis that you do around communism and democracy, how that mm -hmm. plays into Christian nationalism. But it also gets into the racial part, where when people wanted to envision the quintessential American, it wasn't a black person. It wasn't a, 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 an indigenous person. It wasn't a woman. You know, So it, it, it gets to all of these things in terms of the definition of who counts as a quote true American? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't Jesse Owens, right? I mean, you want to yeah. talk about someone who who had who had literally actually, yeah, you know, instead of like you know uh, cosplay on hit, hitting Hitler, like who actually showed up in his in his court and showed him? I mean, goodness gracious, that is a great. And I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna start using that too. Right, I take it. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. He shows up at the Olympics. He he beats every German, everybody there. He proves that, quote unquote, Aryan is not the dominant race. And he he shames uh, Hitler and Nazi Germany. Why isn't Jesse Owens? And there is now um, a storyline in the, the, the comic books about a black person who also received the super soldier 
serum, but was never, you know, celebrated like uh, uh, Steve Rogers, the white man. So that's too deep in the weeds for my listeners. They did not sign up to a Geek Squad uh, podcast, but I totally skipped over your story. Like, I'm really interested in your background because I'll never forget this. Somebody told me, um, it might be, yeah, I was, I was, I think I was at Washington University in St. Louis some years ago, um, headed toward a speaking event and, uh, you know, they assigned some student volunteer to escort me, I think. And then they said, um, all dissertations are autobiographical. And by that they meant, you know, whatever somebody studies and does a thesis on or a project on, it probably intersects with their personal life in some way, shape, or form. So I'm wondering if the same is true of this project, and particularly in terms of your background with religion, mainline Protestantism, and just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and first I'll note a little bit my co-author, we have a little bit different story on this. So Bo has been a mainline Protestant his whole life in the Disciples of Christ uh, t- tradition. He's a minister now in Indianapolis in, uh, at a Disciples of Christ congregation. I've been on both sides of the white Protestant world. So I grew up evangelical. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. I went to a Southern Baptist college. I briefly went to a Southern Baptist seminary and got kicked out. Oh, uh, what did you get kicked so, out for? <laughs> uh, I wrote a paper uh, saying that women should be allowed to be pastors. And, and I did it just to get a rise out of them. And it was a whole lot more successful than I anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> I was already leaving. And so anyways. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's significant and speaks to a lot of what's happening right now in the SBC. Like right? uh, as we record this, they're about to have their annual meeting in 2024 and the hot button topic Still the issue is women in ministry women's ordination so yeah you were prophetic yeah. then <laughs> <laughs> and so i uh I, I spent several years in virginia teaching at james madison university and during that time i was part of a mennonite church usa congregation so that was my kind of first entry point into mainline protestant world and also impacts a lot of my my theology and thinking about church and state issues still today. I'm back in the Baptist world, and uh, I have I have been on staff with churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and American Baptist Churches USA. The church oh, that my. I am a member of yeah. is a Cooperative Baptist Fellowship church, and mm-hmm. we have a uh, our, our first female pastor in our history of what 170 some odd years. Wow. And so, you know, that, that shows a progression of that church as well. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about who I am and wh- where I associate in this world. So I've been on both sides of the, the evangelical and mainline Protestant world. I, I am a mainliner now. And so that impacts a lot of thinking in this book. Uh, so part of the thing we've been wanting to do is to say like, and this is something we're, we're having with reporters, right? Is like, you know what? White evangelicals aren't the only Christian group that you should be thinking about and writing Hello. about. <laughs> and so like, here's some other Christians that one, were really significant in, in creating some of the problems and that two, are still wrestling and still have some things to do. And you know what? Might actually lead the way in helping make a difference because we think this is more fertile soil. There's a, there's a, Maybe I'm picking up a sort of contrarian impulse (laughs) in you. (laughs) And I don't mean that. I think it's the first time I've been called contrarian. (laughs) (laughs) I don't mean in a contentious way. But when you look at, you know, even in seminary when a lot, and I went to seminary as well, where a lot of students are looking to fit in to gain some credential and not necessarily rock the boat or check all the boxes that they think the seminary wants them to, your impulse was, well, let me, let me explore this topic and see what, what they do. And then even with this book, it's not just explaining or elucidating a topic. You're actually going against a lot of the sort of everyday wisdom or uh, understanding here. Is that right? Is there, is there, is there that, you know, like, let me, let me kind of push the boundary here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we joked as we were writing the book at times that we were going to make all of our friends upset, you know, because we were writing about <laughs> all of our mainline friends. And, and I mean, Bo probably worried about that more than me. He's a good pastoral heart and, you know, people <laughs> person. And I'm just yeah. like, yeah, whatever. So, you know, we'll, we'll follow, we'll go where the evidence leads. 
but I mean, like a contrarian spirit, my, my favorite, like this kind of like personal moment in the book is when, and I just stumbled across it, wasn't even something I looked for. We have a moment where we actually even out our publisher for publishing some Christian nationalism <laughs> stuff in the past. And I was like, oh, we're an equal oh, opportunity nice. offender. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll even point out the fact that our publisher, our credit, he laughed, uh, the, the, the head of the publishing company, Chalice Press, he laughed about it. They left it in the book, of course. So, you yeah. know, that's that's great as well. But that's part of what we're trying to model here, right, is, is that we all need to look at our own faith traditions, mm. our own church. And like you know, this idea of, of Christian national on a continuum, it would be easy to look at the white evangelicals who stormed the Capitol on January 6th and be like, that's Christian nationalism and we need to condemn that, which we do. But that could be cathartic to just kind of point at the other, uh, you know, almost that that uh, parable of Jesus, right? Thank God, thank you, God, that I'm not one of those mm-hmm. white evangelicals storming the Capitol and then missing our own role in confusing American and Christian identities and the, old, the role that our own churches and institutions have played along the way. And I think that's the crux of the book. It's this critical self-examination. Um, and you even put in there, take take the log out of your own eye before you try to take the splinter out of your neighbors. And that, I think, is maybe even the most important contribution of the book is to, to tell Christians of other stripes who are not fundamentalist evangelical, this can be in your tradition too. And it helps to turn a mirror on where you are now and how you got here historically to examine the presence of Christian nationalism uh, and and do something about it in in your own sort of uh, backyard kind of a thing. So I really appreciate that. That's always a timely message. Now, one more you know aspect of your biography is is your education and um, what your research interests are, what your background is academically. Yeah, so as so I mentioned, I went to a, a Southern Baptist college and started off as a pastoral ministry major and added communication because I was on the speech and debate team and I was over there anyway. So I thought I might as well get some hours. I ended up walking with communication by the time we left. So there it is again, yeah. speech and debate. <laughs> You 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 like to you like to argue you like to take right, the opposite right. side. I see, right. I see it. I see it. <laughs> I feel like I'm being psychoanalyzed here now. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm just noticing <laughs> patterns, and I think so, it's a great thing. I did a year at seminary, and that was uh that was during this transition period of kind of of, of finding where I felt like I was being called, uh, and realizing that it wasn't as a kind of traditional pastoral role, but that's not my gifting. Yeah. And so I, it, it I kind of stumbled into where I am now primarily as, you know, as a writer and, and seeing that as my, as my ministry. And so I ultimately ended up going to the university of Missouri and did my master's and PhD in political communication. Hmm. And so my, my, my dissertation is actually on religious rhetoric in presidential campaigns. Goodness. Uh, looking at primarily 1976 through 2008 was the most recent campaign at the point that I had graduated and how the various presidential candidates invoke the Bible, talk about faith. And, 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 and one of the arguments I was making there is that we had become an evangelical society and it was changing the way our candidates talk about religion, right? So if mm. evangelicals are more outspoken about their faith, it changes the way candidates have to prove that they're actually religious enough. And so that mm. has impacted our campaigns in a significant way. That's a critical period. You said 76 to 2008. So yes. that's Jimmy Carter yep. Um, yep. Through, and through Obama. Yeah. Through Obama. And I think 76, is that the one they, they said the year of the evangelical was. or something like that? And so the argument yeah, I make so. was instead of being the year of the evangelical, it was the era of the evangelicals was starting. Yes. Yes. So, so prior, prior to Carter, four out of 37 presidents were evangelicals. And then the next five out of six were, all right. So something had changed. And so in, in every single election cycle, uh, what I found was that the candidate who talked in the general election, the most about faith, the most about religion won every single time. No way. And so that we had created this kind of de facto religious test for office that you had to prove. It wasn't who went to church the most. It wasn't who was the most sincere devout, but it was who talked about it the most. Is correlation causation in your view? I mean, there's definitely, I, I, I think it's, I don't think it's the only factor in the elections, but I do think it is a factor and it's significantly enough that it's happening in in every single election cycle there that it's one of those things that candidates know they need to do it, right? They know they have to talk about it. And so then it becomes a cynical ploy, which, which by the way, gets us into the Trump era. I mean, so my book, it came out as a book in I think 2011 and then a paperback edition came out in 2012 and I wrote an, uh, an epilogue in 20 for 2012 
uh, and and I, I I flirted with the idea of Donald Trump running for president in my epilogue. Oh no way! And, that and that, that like well. even even that someone like Donald Trump could use religion uh, to you know someone as godless as him could use religion to run for president. Um, and so, so unfortunately, that did happen. Wow! How did you choose Trump? Was it because of the birther stuff? So, yeah, or? yeah, because he had flirted with running in uh-huh. 2011. And didn't because he was doing the birther stuff. And I was actually at a family research council, I think, family research council okay. gathering that Trump spoke at. Mm. And he did he did his religious appeal to the audience. And it was so awkward and bad, right? Mm. I mean, it was like two Corinthians level. Well, it hasn't had that look. <laughs> but he he wanted to prove that he was religious. And so he he showed up the picture of his confirmation as, I don't know, 11, 11 12-year-old uh, uh, at a Presbyterian Church USA uh, yeah. congregation and starts talking about, see, I was confirmed. Isn't that great? You know, that kind of thing. And it was just like, like even Donald Trump was trying to prove Goodness. that he, uh, in 2011, that he was religious. And that just struck me as like, see, he knows the game he has to play mm. to win. That mm. even he was thinking about the fact that he had to try to pretend to be something that he wasn't. Prescient again. You did it with the women's ordination. I would have loved for that one to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Uh, but, you're, but you're too observant for that. Let's dig a little bit into the history of mainline Protestants. Um, one entry point is uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. So tell us about the significance, like, like what was unique about his religious journey as president and then how that leads into some of the Christian nationalism stuff. Yeah. I mean, as you know, having read through the book, most of what we're looking at is late forties and throughout the fifties. And so there's a little bit with Truman, but I mean, the heart of what's happening is the Eisenhower presidency. We seem to have these waves of Christian nationalism and we're going through a wave right now. And the last really big wave was was the Eisenhower presidency, mm-hmm. which put a lot of this stuff under God and the Pledge of Allegiance and God we trust as our national motto, national prayer breakfast starts. All these things are happening at that time period. And so that's that's really important. And so, you know, Eisenhower really hadn't been that religious. I mean, his childhood, he'd, his family had been part of the Church of the Brethren, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and he really wasn't. I mean, he kind of proved that he wasn't really a devout in those traditions because then he went and joined the military and they're both pacifist groups. Mm. Right. And so as he's, you know, getting ready to to become president, he he feels this expectation that he needs to be part of a church to lead the country, which is in itself an interesting fact that he seemed to feel that he needed to be, even though we again, Article six, U.S. Constitution, no religious test for office. Like it was not something that was mandated for him. And so he decided to join the Presbyterian tradition of his wife and actually gets baptized just a, in the first you know, 10 days of his presidency. And this mm. is actually, this was part of where the Baptizing America title comes from that kind of thinking about that moment, right? And so like mm. Eisenhower goes to his Presbyterian church and gets baptized. The pastor makes a big deal about it. Right. And this to us is a really significant kind of metaphor for what was about to happen for his eight years as president, that he went under the water and now he was going to take the nation there as well. And so, (laughs) you know, that's that's really significant what's happening in this time period. And so not only is he now a fresh mainline Protestant, but most members of Congress are identifying because these are the these are the dominant religious denominations at this time period. And so the key leaders in Congress are our mainline Protestant, mainline Protestant clergy have an oversized influence on society. And so all of the stuff that's happening during his presidency to help try to make us a Christian nation, he and his fellow mainline Protestants are putting into place. So what are some of the occurrences during the Eisenhower presidency that push us toward people saying America is a Christian nation? Yeah, you know, I mentioned a couple of them, you know, like we had the National Prayer Breakfast and God We Trust the National Model. I, I actually think under God and the Pledge of Allegiance mm. might be the most significant of, of the examples, just because it's it's so clear of a story, how it happened. It's it's the story of one sermon. I mean, literally, uh, one sermon got changed the United States Pledge of Allegiance from what it had been for decades it was originally godless, if you will, right? The the it's generally attributed, although there's some debate about authorship, but it's generally attributed to a to a Baptist minister 
who had written the original Pledge of Allegiance and uh, a Baptist socialist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you've been called oh, a socialist as well. But uh, <laughs> uh, but he was actually a Baptist socialist and admitted. I mean, he was part of the socialist organization. It was writing for uh, for why, you know, why Christians should be socialists. Yeah. And God was left out of the pledge. And then there's a there's a, a pastor at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in D.C. happens to know in February of 54 that Eisenhower is going to be sitting in the pew that Sunday because it's the Sunday closest to Lincoln's birthday. Lincoln had been part of that church. And so they had a tradition of trying to get the presidents to come attend on Lincoln's birthday. So he essentially writes a sermon for one person, which isn't necessarily perhaps the best pastoral approach. But I mean, uh, I could say that without having ever had the president show up in my church. So, you know, I mean, you know, maybe I (laughs) I would have that same temptation. (laughs) (laughs) But his argument is, and again, this is this is a progressive guy. Like I said, he later marches with MLK. He protests against the Vietnam War. But he also wants to make sure America is marked as a Christian nation as we're fighting those, quote, godless atheist communists Mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. And so his sermon, I mean, so I I knew that the story had existed and I had read about it before. But before writing the book, I hadn't actually actually read the sermon. Uh And then it was actually reading the sermon that I realized it was so much worse than I realized this incident was because he, he, he lays it out. In very Christian nationalistic terms, you know, America is a Christian nation. We were founded that way. He says that the American way of life was based on the Ten Commandments and the words of Jesus as a Nazareth. And so then he's starting to argue that that's a problem then. Our pledge doesn't match what we were created to be. Mm. And in fact, he says the pledge was so generic that he could he could hear someone in Moscow saying the pledge to their flag, right? And so we needed some way of marking it as something different. But then uh, the most stunning part of the sermon, and this is the other reason why I like this example, because not only is it so obvious, we know that this one sermon made the change, but also he says the quiet part out loud because he then raises the, the, he raises the objection that he thinks someone might have. Well, what about an atheist? Which at that point is only a couple of percent of the American population. It's a more significant issue today in a more pluralistic society, but he's, he, he argues in the sermon Philosophically speaking, an atheistic American is a contradiction in terms. And then adds that they are spiritual parasites. I mean, yeah, and this is the sermon. I mean, I mean, Eisenhower is moved by the sermon. Members of Congress are moved by the sermon. It's printed in the congressional record. Excerpts go out on you know television, and they they introduce multiple bills to change the Pledge of Allegiance. This is in February by Flag Day in June of 1954. So we're at the 70th anniversary. Eisenhower signs it. I mean, this all Mm. happens fast. And I mean, Bone, I joke that you know we're just happy if someone remembers our sermon the next week. Right. But I mean, this sermon had, a, I mean, I mean, props to this pastor. The sermon had an impact, but I don't think it was a healthy impact because especially when he says the quiet part out loud, that this, this was a way of marking the nation and defining some Americans as by definition, not truly American, mm. that they are, that it's a contradiction of terms. And so this is what Christian nationalism does. It confuses, it fuses those American and Christian identities and that if you don't believe in Christianity, you cannot be a real American. That was a problem in 1954. It's a bigger problem today because that means we're marking a whole lot more Americans as not really, truly American. Mm. Again, mic drop moments. Um, you talk about civil religion. And I think what you're doing is collapsing the distance between civil religion and Christian nationalism. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just you know acknowledge on our writing process. This was the last chapter that we finished. It's chapter three in the book <laughs> out of like twelve. But this one we just like kept like, no, we'll come back to that later. Because it, it's, it was such a complex issue, one, to try to figure out what we were wanting to articulate here. And also recognizing that we were cutting against some of the dominant literature, if you will. Because I think a lot of people treat civil religion and Christian nationalism as pretty distinct things. And, and civil religion is a positive and Christian nationalism is negative. 
And and the more that we were looking at it, we weren't really sure that they're that, that the lines are there. Mm. That, that, I mean, when Robert Bella wrote his essay on this idea of civil religion, that that does all of the scholars are based on that idea. It comes out in 1967. He he uses some examples, for instance, like under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, and we're like, wait a minute, but that's Christian nationalism. That's not civil religion. And but he thinks it's this unifying, you know, religious symbols and language that bring us all together. And he thinks it's it's we necessary that we need these religious symbols and we need this religious language, this God language, this generic God language, to bring us together as a nation. And so we we basically think that there are two big picture problems. You know, one is the demographic shift. So let's just assume that civil religion did work. It was a unifying thing. It can't work anymore. Mm. So in 1967, when his essay comes out, 92% of Americans identify as Christian. That's, I mean, so God language is pretty unifying. I mean, pretty much everyone comes together. But today, it's only two out of three. It's only two. Mm. One third of Americans do not identify as Christian. And most of that increase has been the rise of the nuns, right? The N-O-N-E-S. And so this God language doesn't unify us. So even if civil religion did work, I think that it would look like Christian nationalism today. Mm. It just doesn't unify us. I'm also though not sure that it was ever actually as innocent and pure as it seemed because we, again, still had a, a small percentage of Americans. I mean, even if we if we take Jewish Americans, which were what 3% back then, is feeling like they were included because it was God language, not Jesus language, generally. Mm-hmm. Not, not always. We, we have some examples of Jesus language uh, being put in there in some of this time period. Uh, but that, still only 95% of Americans, right? And so you, you, have a, you have a group of Americans that were being excluded as not really part of America, like the under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. That's civ- if that's civil religion, that's really not as innocent as it seems. It just impacts more Americans today. And so we talk about civil religion as maybe being, you know, the kinder, gentler, cuddlier version of Christian nationalism or the gateway drug to Christian nationalism, but it's still essentially Christian nationalism. Mm. So it was really interesting because you introduced the book talking about Bishop Michael Curry's prayer on January 6, 2022, so a year after the insurrection. And you deliberately contrast because God language shows up in both of those events, the prayer and, of course, the insurrection. Now, it still feels like what Bishop Curry did was dramatically different than what was happening on January 6th and and the prayers even that you highlight there. What, what, What would you say to to that in terms of you know collapsing that distance between civil religion and Christian nationalism, the prayer of Bishop Michael Curry versus the prayer of the QAnon shaman, um, aren't they different? Maybe it's just on that continuum though, right? And so uh, yeah, there's a, there is a less violent version of Christian nationalism. But one of the things that we try to do in the book from time to time is to say, well, what if someone else had done this? Mm-hmm. Right? And so you know we have this prayer service. It's it's the one year anniversary. Pretty much only Democrats show up because by that point, Republicans were arguing that it was just a normal tourist visit. <laughs> right. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I've been to the U.S. Capitol, unfortunately, never looked like January 6, 2021 when I was visiting. Uh, but so they were not participating for the most part in the vigil that day. But I, so I turned it on on C-SPAN because I'm a nerd and I thought I'd watch this live. And and I was actually stunned. I expected to be like a full blown interfaith, you know, mm-hmm. event. And and it was a Christian prayer service. Only Christian leadership involved. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, led a moment of, of, of silent prayer. Uh, as, you, as you know, the Episcopal presiding bishop, Michael Curry, prays and prays that we would be one nation under God, prays that God would make us the democracy that, that God wants us to be, essentially is praying on behalf of the members of Congress standing behind him that they would do God's will, and not all of them are Christians. Uh, and then they sing a couple of patriotic Christian songs, God bless America, my country tis at thee, and that's it. It's over. And the, well, if Speaker Mike Johnson mm. had led this event and Sean Foyt had done the singing of the patriotic hymns instead of someone from the Marine Band, 
And if Paula White Kane had said the prayers and you changed nothing else, you literally just had word for word, everything the same, but you changed those three figures, we would call it Christian nationalism. Mm. They're on the steps of the Capitol as an official event led by the Speaker of the House. And so Christian nationalism has to be, you know, more than just God talk by those that we disagree with politically. You know, we need some consistency there. And I do think, I mean, it is important to note, it is different than January 6th, 2021. It is not as violent. It is not as dangerous. But I think it's also still part of the problem. It's mm. part of that discipling that we have done for generations that has made people comfortable with the idea of seeing no space, no distance between God and America. Mm-hmm. And that that leads that can lead people to the to the point where they're storming the Capitol. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not the only thing, but we have made it too easy and too comfortable to engage in Christian nationalism. And that's really is our call for the book. I mean, you know, Bishop Curry has done an excellent job of speaking out against Christian nationalism, of challenging the racism and the violence and the heretical dangers of Christian nationalism. What we're trying to note here is that even those of us who are worried about Christian nationalism can unintentionally still empower it, still espouse it. I mean, we we admit in the book that we have both preached and pastored at churches that had the American flag in the sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And right? so we have been part of the problem. And so the question is, is how do we move further down the continuum away, even further away from January 6th of 2021? And so that, that yeah, that's our, maybe it's a contrary and that's our way of starting the book. But um, we also wanted to show, so if January 6th, 2021 shows us the the depth of Christian nationalism on the right, especially the dangerous, violent depth. We think that January 6th, 2022 shows the breadth of Christian mm. nationalism across mm. political and religious continuums. What would you have done differently on January 6th, 2022 to commemorate that date? That's a great question. I appreciate that. I haven't been asked that before. I, I would, I think the, 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 I wouldn't have had a prayer service. I don't think it was necessary, right? I think it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what happened in the insurrection. Mm. This, that, the, that, that Christian nationalism really did fuel this. We see this in the January 6th committee mm. uh, that, that ignored the threat of Christian nationalism. It seemed to frame it more as a Trumpian problem. And I mean, if Trump is removed from the political scene, we will still have the danger of white Christian nationalism that led to January 6th, right? It predated him and it will outlive him. Mm -hmm. And so we need to realize that this isn't merely a Trumpian problem. And I think that's what the framing of that day was. It was, you know, Trump was a danger and a risk and we survived it. And so we just, it wasn't that we had too much a merging of Christianity and Americanism, it was that we just needed a different kind of it, the kinder, mm. friendlier version of it. And so I think we could have had, I mean, the, the, some of the stuff that was done inside the, the house chamber where people were giving speeches, that was a great way of remembering it. If they wanted to go to the steps, uh, I think they could have had the time of silence, whether someone wanted to pray or not, that would have been fine, but I would have skipped the prayers completely. Mm. I mean, if you really want to insist on prayers, you need to have a diverse interfaith group. But uh, honestly, I think we could do with a whole lot less prayer and a whole lot more action uh, in Congress today. I mean, as you know, we we have a whole section going off on House chaplains and Senate chaplains as well, right, as a significant problem. Um, I I think we need to get out of the business of government prayer. Mm. Is some of, or even could it be construed as the problem of Christian nationalism, one of Christian privilege? And I say that in the sense of, you know, if you do have a truly interfaith thing where Jewish people, Buddhists, Muslims, even atheists maybe uh, are represented, is it, is it then less of an issue? That's a, I, I, I think I, I like your framing there because you know what? We never have this question when there's like just a Christian prayer. Mm-hmm. We're never like, oh, maybe we should have someone else. But I'm thinking like, was it Alabama? There was a state this year on the National Day of Prayer in their state legislature, had a Hindu pray. And then, and they rotate, you know, people praying every day. But because it just happened to be the National Day of Prayer, they were suddenly realized, oh, wait, this isn't good enough. So then we had to have a, have a Christian pray too. Oh, goodness. But we would have yeah. never done it. In the other 49 states, we didn't do it. We didn't be like, oh, we had a Christian pray in the National Day of Prayer. We should have someone else pray too. Mm-hmm. Right? So, that, I mean, that is, that. is that. Is that a sense of Christian privilege? I mean, every single chaplain mm-hmm. that we have had in the history of the United States has been from a Christian tradition. 
And as we know, most of them, almost all of them have been mainline Protestants. Uh, and, and, you know, we've only had a, a few Catholics. We, we, we've, we, I guess we have finally broken the gender barrier with uh, our first mm-hmm. female house chaplain. Uh, but it is seen as a Christian job, right? And so, yeah, there's definitely this this centering or this privileging of of Christian. And then if we add anyone else, it's interfaith. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One lingering question I had after reading was, what do we do with, I think, the human impulse of wanting our faith to help shape our politics? Because I don't think it's possible, nor even advisable, to tell people, you know, leave your faith out of the public political discourse altogether. I just, you know, we bring our full selves to this thing, and it shapes our policy positions, things of that nature. So what do we do with the fact that even if you're not following a particular organized religion— You know, there's a spiritual impulse, and especially in times of crisis, whether that's 9-11, the election of a certain president, an insurrection, there's this impulse of this is bigger than voting. This is bigger than who's in office. I'm just curious from your perspective, like, what, what do we do with that human element of spirituality that will inevitably intersect with our politics? Yeah, that that's a, it is a good point because I think sometimes when we start talking about separating church and state, some people, you know, they'll say, "Well, well, but I can't separate, you know, my religion and my politics," and that that, that is different, right? And so, like, the the church and state issue comes about codifying something, mm. and so I can be motivated by my faith, but it's different than codifying my faith and saying that you have to believe this because this is my faith, or that you have to believe this. You need to be a Christian to vote for this. I mean, one example that I use is I testify a lot in the Missouri House and Senate because I, I live here in the state capitol. And, and I all, am often on church state issues. And those ones are, are talking about religion. And it's usually me trying to stop Christian nationalism right now at the state level. Thank you. For your but a couple a couple of times I've I've testified on capital punishment issues and to argue for why we should stop killing people in, in a ironic way of trying to prove that killing people is wrong. Amen. And my faith motivates me. I mean, mm-hmm. I I am opposed to the death penalty because I read the Bible and because of how I read the Bible and because of preachers and theologians that have helped me think about this issue. I can't separate that. It is it is my motivation. It is why I show up. But when I go and testify to the members of a committee, I'm not telling them you need to ban the death penalty because Jesus said so mm-hmm. or that, you know, if you're a Christian, there's no way you can possibly, you know, vote against this bill that you have to vote my way. I go and make arguments that regardless of what they believe, they sh- I'm making an argument why they should still vote to limit or end the death penalty. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a that's a little bit of the difference, right? So I'm still motivated by the by public square. I'm allowed to talk about my faith in the public square. I'm not trying to qu- codify it and I'm not expecting others to adopt my religious perspective in order to then also adopt my political perspective. It's a little bit nuanced there. It's a little bit, maybe a little bit different. It's easier to just be like, this is what the Bible says, do it. I mean, you know, yeah, come on, thus saith the word, right? I mean, that would be easier. I also think with Christian nationalism, there's something in, 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 in its limiting nature. So it's, in, it's inherently anti-democratic, small d, democratic. And so there, you can have a faith-based tradition that can be talking about their faith, but is fighting for other people, not just their own people. Like Christian nationalists are saying, we want more power and more, quote, rights or privileges for me and my, my people. I mean, that's what makes a difference with, say, the, you know, the movement of Martin Luther King Jr. or the Poor People's Campaign today is that, one, it's interfaith. And that too, you know, when King's going in the square and is clearly talking about God, but what he's not ever saying is we need more power and more rights for my fellow Christians or my fellow black Christians, right? He's saying we need equality and equity for all people. So even those that don't look like him and even those that don't believe like him, he's wanting them to have the same rights as he's demanding for himself. That's really different from Christian nationalism, 
which is arguing that this group of people get special privileges. Only this group of people can be the politicians and the presidents and lead. And so I think that's also another distinction there that you can have a faith-based movement, but who are you fighting for? Are you just fighting for your faith? Or are you fighting for everyone? That's exactly the distinction I try to make between white Christian nationalism and the black Christian political tradition, uh, which does use a lot of God and country talk mm -hmm. in sermons, in the politicians. I mean, you've got an ordained minister, Reverend Raphael Warnock, right? Yeah. But the ends are so different. Um, what I typically say is white Christian nationalism seeks to contract democracy and uh, make it the purview of a few where historically the black Christian political tradition has expanded democracy for all, no matter what religion or race um, they are. So I think that's a helpful distinction. My last question is this. If we moderate um, the God talk in the political sphere, uh, what becomes or how do we have a sort of agreed upon morality and ethic, civic ethic, if you will? Uh, because I think um, a lot of times religion is invoked as a as a as a way to bring folks together over some shared values, uh, not necessarily a theology, right? But uh, shared civic values. If that's not there, or if, if that's so harmful, in what sense can we have a shared sense of like civic community? and understanding what can, what can unite us. Yeah. And I think this is what, this is what Robert Bellow was trying to do with civil religion, right? He recognized that we did need shared values to keep us together. I just happen to think we can do it without God uh, as without framing this nation as a Christian or a God nation. Because I think, I think in, in two ways, I think one, we can have basic morality that people of all faith traditions and no faith traditions teach their little kids. Right? I mean, it was just like, let's think about like, what do we expect our, our preschool and kindergarten kids to, how do we expect them to behave? Right. You know, be nice, treat others the way you want to be treated, tell the truth, right. Hands to yourself. Right? I mean, you know, some basic rules <laughs> that sure you and I might, you know, teach that because of our Christian faith, but other people are teaching those same basic, you know, good manners and the way that you treat people with respect and dignity, regardless of the religious tradition. So I think we do need to get to a point where we have those shared values in truth telling uh, and that we have shared values in, you know, people not cheating and, you know, and, and stealing and lying and, and so on and so on, which would, would dramatically, dramatically transform our politics today you know? if we could just get to those basic values. The other thing I think, the second point I think here is I also think we could just have the shared value of democracy. Mm. That we don't have to, we don't have to support democracy or bring God into it. We can support democracy in and of itself. Not that it's a mm. perfect system, but that it's better than any other political system when it's truly implemented. And and I, I, I mean, this is still a young experiment. I mean, we we really have only been a, a democracy since 1965. Mm -hmm. We so and, and the, what we're seeing on the pushback to Christian nationalism is that we've moved to you know more of an actual democracy where every citizen has a right to vote. And they realize they don't have the demographics for that. They don't have the votes. And so rather than changing their ideas and their policies, they want to just change the rules on who votes and goes back to us not really being a democracy. But I think as Christians, we can support democracy because it, it aligns with some basic Christian ideas, the, the, the human dignity of every single individual, that every single person is created in the image of God. But I think politically, regardless of what you believe religiously, democracy is a good that we can unite around. And that's, I mean, so maybe Robert Bell's right. We don't have a shared value of democracy today. And that's why our nation is falling apart. But I don't think saying God more often is going to save us. What we need is a, an actual acceptance and commitment to telling the truth, not lying and cheating, and uh, to democracy and protecting democracy. Mm. That is a perfect word to end on. And I don't know, this is a ministry, Reverend Doctor. <laughs> the way you're putting things is really, really helpful. Thank you so much for 
your latest book, you and your co-author, it is Baptizing America, How Mainline Protestants Help Build Christian Nationalism, and uh, available now for purchase? It, it, it's available wherever you want to buy your books. If you go to chalicepress.com and use the promo code BA Podcast, BA for Baptizing America, BA Podcast, they'll give you a third off the list price there, but Ooh. you can go anywhere else as well. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us on Footnotes. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jamar. It's always great to see you, and I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.